questions relating to business and family. Um, one question is how have you maintained a marriage while growing a successful business? And the other one is um, you've said that children are your most important investment. How are you investing in them, especially in regards to taking your business into the future? So Bob, do you have anyone in your immediate family that you're grooming to take on Beaumont Tiles? Um, look, it, it's worth talking about that a bit because it's quite a big issue for a lot of family companies and uh, I think uh, um, uh, it's different for every every business and every family, but uh, I'm really happy with the way, the way we went. Um, I corporatised uh, Beaumont Tiles uh, quite a few years ago whereby um, we have a, uh, a board which is comprised mainly of, of family uh, with one extra and that's a corporate board which is responsible for uh, direction and um, governance and so on. And we also have an executive board uh, which run the business. Um, and uh, we said, okay, we're not going to assume that the business is there to provide work for family members. And I think that's a real mistake that a lot of businesses make. They, they uh, just provide work for a family member, sometimes it being a right, and uh, quite often it's extremely disruptive and certainly not fair on loyal, long-term employees. So uh, we made that decision. We, we also said that um, if any, any family member did join the business, they actually had to jump, jump through a lot more hoops than um, anybody else. So they actually had to get board approval to apply, and then they had to be the best. So. Um uh, as, as far as the family is concerned, aside from myself, there's only one family member in the company. That's my daughter. She's got no aspirations to be CEO. Um, she's um, a strategic designer uh, and she's very, very happy doing that. Uh, but um, we've got no other family members and we haven't gone out to try and convince other family members to come into the business. Um, I know it's a bit corny, but uh, in another way, um, our family regards uh, people who work for Beaumont Tiles as being extended family anyway. So um, if there are no family members working one day in the business, that's not going to worry our family at all because uh, we think that it's, they're our extended family. We owe them a responsibility and, uh, and, and so uh, we care about them. And Frank, how about for you? Uh, how do you invest in your kids, but also looking at succession plans and handing over? Well, um, the situation is a little different with us, um, but not the basics are no different at all. I used to say, my, our, our kids used to want to work in school holidays and I used to say to them, well you just work like an ordinary worker and the name Sealy will do you no good at all because I have told the people you'll be working for that that counts for nothing. You're there on your own merits or you're not there. And even to the point where at one point in time one of my sons wasn't sure what he wanted to do and thought he'd perhaps like to do a tool making apprenticeship. We had one available but I said to the general manager, do not give him the job unless he's the best applicant. And you know that does create family because if you run your business for your family, you actually ex exclude all the other people who would like to be part of that family. That's right. However, um, our second son, John, um, spent some years in missionary work overseas with an organisation called Operation Mobilisation. Went to some interesting places, not the sort of places I'd want to go. He went to uh, Istanbul, he liked that. His wife didn't like it very much. Then they went to Tashkent and uh, I don't think he liked it very much and his wife hated it. Uh, and uh, from there he went to be uh, the uh, CFO of Operation Mobilisation because he'd got a he worked at Deloitte here he'd got a, an economics degree before he he left so he was there for a number of years and then he's been involved in other things and it's only in recent times that he's come 
back to Australia and f to start with he was in Perth and he was in Melbourne and uh, w at an earlier stage we had actually tried to recruit him into the business. Well, it's unbelievable what that guy wanted. And I said, well, you're not going to get any of those things. Uh, and said, well, almost, if, well, if you, want, if you want me, that's what you've got to do. And I said, well, we don't want you. <laughs> And so he came back and he'd been in Melbourne and I'd heard he'd been on a couple of boards, smaller companies, but n nevertheless he'd been quite effective there. And uh, uh, he came to me and he said, uh, totally different attitude. If, uh, if there was ever an opportunity on the board at Sealy International, I'd really love to be considered. And if you say, no, you don't want that, I'll accept that. Well, I thought, okay, he's in the right space now. So <laughs> he, he came onto the board about, uh, I suppose, three years ago now, and he's contributed quite well. And like Bob, they have to do more. They have to be more than just the rest of the people to justify uh, themselves being there. Because, you see, other people won't see them that way. Unless they are more, they won't see them as being equal. They'll see them as, as having some advantage. Um, and he's con contributed well and then uh, he was actually heading up uh, uh, Alpha which was uh, a another Christian organisation here in Australia and he came to us and said um, my wife and I believe our time at Alpha is coming to an end I said oh that's interesting I said no more I said to Cathy afterwards be great if he came on board full time uh, but I left it to him and he came back and said is there any opportunity and there was one so he's been with us on a full time basis and uh, he will take over I believe God willing the running of the business but the business will continue to be a family business for the family of the people who work there and we want that to go on into the future not as a memorial to us because we, as I said earlier on, we're only stewards of that business. It's been loaned to us, but so that it can go on and be a blessing, because it can be a blessing, and we may talk about that later on, to a lot more people than just those who work there. We'll get on to philanthropy in a moment. Um, I also want to come back to the idea of handing over in the interim, not necessarily after you've gone, but just uh, briefly, how all of us would have heard and seen stories of marriages that unfortunately were um, damaged or even lost along the way as business empires have been built. How have you two been able to maintain successful marriages? My formula is quite easy. I overmarried. You overmarried? Oh, overmarried, yes. <laughs> and how many times? <laughs> oh, just once. <laughs> no, um, uh, my wife's been wonderfully supportive and um, really I, I never realised how supportive she had been until uh, years after we'd had the kids as babies and they'd grown up and, and uh, then I saw my daughter coping with our grandchild and I thought... You did all that, and I wasn't, I wasn't there to help you. Yeah. Um, but we talk about life-work um, balance a lot, you know, we, we talk about that. But um, I think we've got to be realistic about work-life balance. If you set yourself a goal for large success in business, you've got to be prepared to work probably 80 hours a week. If you're not prepared to work really hard, really long, and take really big risks, you're not going to succeed. And so, yes, you, you need to try to achieve that balance, but there are times, there are seasons in your life where you have to just work like crazy. And um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that as long as you're intentional with every moment of your day. If you just let it drift, then that's really bad. But if you say, okay, that's my work time, but I'm going to set aside these times for the family and it's going to be really quality, then that's okay. Um, you can work your 80 hours a week. But if you just say, I'm going to work 80 hours a week and then I'm going down the pub for the rest of the time, no, that's wrong. So I think work-life balance is, is attainable, but um, only if you plan it and only with an incredibly um, wonderful supporting partner. 
Well, uh, look, I, I agree absolutely with what Bob says. Uh, and you say, uh, so we're going to be successful, but why? Providing it's not for yourself. If you realise, if you understand that what you've got has been entrusted to you to do the best you can with, then, then that uh, gives you, that almost, can I say, sanctifies that sort of commitment. Um, but there are non-negotiables in that. And Sunday was a non-negotiable. I didn't go to work on Sundays. Sometimes I would go after the family was asleep if I needed to, late on Sunday night. But, and once, I remember when we were bringing out some new gas heaters, we worked, Cathy and I worked all day Saturday night and we went to church on Sunday morning. I don't remember much about church, but... <laughs> yeah. Now, Frank, I know that several years ago you went through the process. You started the business. It's a little bit different to, to Bob taking over the family business. Um, you had to go through a process of, in some ways, handing over the reins, although you're still very much involved in the business. There's a question, um, how did you cope with handing over the company to others to manage? Um, have you got any advice on that process? Well, um that was really goes back to when we had that dreadful problem with the guy in Greece, and I worked all of the all of 80 hours a week uh, during the year following that, and turned the company round, uh, and appointed a, a board, an independent with independent directors, non-executive directors, and uh, I turned it around and at the board meeting they congratulated me and I said, well that's fine but I'm tired, I need someone else to run this business. And one of them put up his hand, he said, I'll, I'll run the business. Now I know full well with my personality if I'd have said before that experience, okay I want somebody else to run the business, I would have interfered like crazy and he probably would have only stayed two or three weeks. This guy stayed with me for 10 years because I, I, God engineered the situation where I did not really want to be involved in, uh, in the short term and later on I was able to come in and provide advice and support and uh, um, so I mean that was when the handing over process occurred and since then we've had two managing directors. The one we've got currently has been with us for nine years and he told me when he came he only ever stayed anywhere for three years so obviously something's working, it's certainly working for us and it's obviously working for him too. So it's not a problem. But it's not that you withdraw from the business. You, you bring your experience. The wisdom that, that experiences have had gives to, give to you, gives to you. And the wisdom that you get from the Word of God and from living your life in relation to God. And you bring that to bear on the business and the business prospers because of it. Both of you have spoken about staff that have been with you, loyal staff for 25, 30 years. Here's a question. How do you create the positive culture that you both have? Positive cultures don't just happen by accident. How do you craft it? You, you can't generate loyalty without being loyal. And so if you're loyal to uh, your team, they're loyal back to you. And, and I think that's, that's the beginning of um, the culture. But then it comes down to care. And, and what I mean by care is not so much just um, uh, caring for people in a lovely sort of way, it's caring about everything. It's caring about profits, it's caring about sales, it's caring about winning business, but it's also caring about people and their families. Um, uh, and, and you don't need to shout it from the, from the rooftops. Um, we had a situation in, in Melbourne where um, one of our store guys uh, contracted cancer and he had to go, go off to hospital and, and so on. So we just kept paying him. Um, and it just went on and on and on. And uh, we just kept paying him and, and uh, sending a check to his wife. And, and, and that was all good, because the worst thing would be for him to be worrying about money. Um, but we didn't tell anybody. We just did that. We didn't think anybody knew. Anyway, um, the unions rocked up at the door of the warehouse and, and said, uh, yeah, we demand entry and we demand a meeting with your store staff. So uh, um, we said, oh, cool, OK, come in. And um, they met with the store staff. Anyway, 
the the warehouse guys said to the union bloke, look, you guys aren't going to give us anything. And they trotted out this example of the storeman who was still being paid. I didn't know they knew. And they said, you couldn't get us that by negotiation. Get out of here. And they put them on their bike and off they went. Uh, and so, um, you know, you don't have to shout it from the rooftops, but good stuff happens when you do the right thing. Frank, um, a question here. Do you believe that we should be... You, you mentioned championing uh, manufacturing here in South Australia. Do you believe we should be putting in billions to prop up Holden? Absolutely not. I think that's the most ridiculous thing that's ever been done because that money goes straight back to the parent. Whatever they tell you, that money goes straight back to the parent. Now, in the early days, when the under Tom Playford and Roger's here tonight, and he remembers those those days better than I do because Roger's older than I am. Um, <laughs> just took a just took a guess. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, in the days of Tom Playford, I was all for, and I'm still for what he did then putting money into them because that was a growing and a burgeoning business. But now it's become something whereby they squeal, the head office tells them to, and money is poured in, and six months later they want some more. Where's the money gone? It's gone straight back there. Now, I am not against supporting the uh, automotive industry, but you've got to do it on the basis of a quid pro quo. So we will give you X millions of dollars, providing you use it to... to uh, uh, do innovative things and then you protect them in such a way that the value of that uh, that that innovation generates stays here in the state. Yes, General Motors may may take it across and use it elsewhere, but they pay a royalty back to South Australia. So South Australia's got to get something out of it. This is just a funnel uh, that goes into a bottomless pit and it is, is uh, crass stupidity. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Now, Bob has asked me a question. It's not the first time he's done it. He's getting, getting things a bit muddled up here. But he said, what do you really think? <laughs> This next question. As a relatively new Christian, but many years of non-Christian business habits, what would be your tips on what to spend time focusing on to turn those habits around? Well, um... In Psalm 119 it says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? And the answer is given by hearkening to your word. The word of God, the Bible, has a purifying effect. It has a convicting effect if we're doing things that we shouldn't be doing or even thinking or saying things that we shouldn't be thinking or saying. It has a purifying, it has a convicting effect. But with God, whatever he says, he will bring in conviction, but he'll also give you encouragement. Whether you're a Christian or you're not a Christian, you read the Word of God, you will find encouragement in there. And it is that that's going to change the way that we do things. So for young Christians, immerse yourself in the Word and in prayer. Bob, do you have anything to add to that? Immerse yourself in the Word and prayer, I would reckon, is a good idea. Um, no, if... I would thoroughly recommend that you study the Bible. Don't just read it, but get into it and study it and find out about it because there's a lot more to it than just the superficial reading. And spending time in prayer is just so important. If you don't do those two things, uh, you'll get the uh, guidance that you seek. And that's actually a, a lovely segue into the work that City Bible Forum does um, in providing support to do just exactly that, getting into the Word and praying and supporting one another. And Craig will tell us about that in a minute. I've just got a couple more questions. He's very eager. He's very eager. Um, but there'll be opportunity to connect with both Bible reading and praying if that's something that you would like to find out more about uh, tonight. Another question. What advice do you have for those at the start of their career? Bob, you were very passionate about having Gen Y join your organisation. Any further advice? Not just for Gen Ys, but for anyone starting a career. If you're at the start of your career, um, I think you've got to be both focused and flexible, and they sound like opposites. You've got to be focused on where you want to go, but you've got to be flexible enough to change 
as you go to take opportunities to grab those things which occur, which come from left field. Uh, I'm sure you did that, Frank, when, when you uh, went into air conditioning, you grabbed something from left field, turned adversity into, into something positive. Mm. And, and I think um, if you're at the beginning of your career, be prepared to work really, really hard. Be prepared to earn trust. Um, do more than you have to and then uh, be prepared to grab opportunities as they occur and let things go if they don't work. Mm. Anything to add to that, Frank? I uh, agree, absolutely. Uh, the only thing I'd add to that is uh, start off by being scrupulously honest. And um, I'll give you just a quick story on that. I, we didn't have, I tried to mortgage the children and I couldn't do that, uh, or, and my wife either, although I can't understand why that couldn't have been done, but um, the fact is we, we had very little. So what I did, I went out and got an order from a company I hadn't dealt with before, Lawrence and Hanson actually, they're still around today, for a thousand uh, portable coolers. And I dummied up a model and they were happy with that. And then I went out to a tool maker because I had to get a number of injection molds dies and there's quite a bit of money involved in that money which I didn't have so I took this order down to a tool maker who was located relatively close to where our factory was he was a Polish uh, guy and a great tool maker die cavity engineering it's not still around but some some may know it uh, they were good good people and I went and I saw Julian Stroker and I said um, I want you to quote me on these dies and he said come back in three days time I'll have the quote I went back in three days time and he and I said yes I like the look of the quote I'll place an order for them he said very good I said there's just one thing I said what's that I said I will need six months credit on these tools he looked at me and he said nobody has ever asked me for six months credit before I need to think about it come back in two days I went back two days later and he said, I told you that nobody had ever asked me for six months credit, and that was true, but plenty of people have taken it. <laughs> and the fact that you were, and I quote him exactly, honest with me, I'm going to give you that credit. You see, when we start off, there's all sorts of things, uh, all sorts of problems that confront us, uh, difficulties that we may be afraid of or we may realise are true and there. And, you know, you get yourself into a situation where you say, well, I've got to make this work. And there's the temptation to compromise the truth or to not tell the whole truth or to not tell it up front. So I believe honesty, integrity, uh, and, and of course you, you included that in what you said, but I just thought a bit of an illustration would give me a chance to say a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> Since when did you need that? Yet? <laughs> And you wonder why I learnt to talk so much. <laughs> Last question. I think uh, it was some questions that I prepared earlier for you. We didn't get to cover it in the other part, but I'm glad that it's been asked from the floor. What organisations and charities do you guys support? Both of you are involved in philanthropy. I wonder if I could extend that. How did you first or why did you first get involved in phil philanthropy? philanthropy? Helping up the... That's easy. <laughs> That's easy for you to say. <laughs> Who you Bob, 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 how about you? How or why did you get involved? I, I don't remember a time when I didn't uh, give a percentage of, of uh, what I received away. Um, I had a father who was incredibly honest and incredibly generous, mm. um, but uh, he never told anybody about what he gave. When he died, we opened up his private books and we were astonished. Oh, he gave a bus to these people. Oh, no, no, he didn't. He gave two buses. <laughs> you know, things like that. Absolutely remarkable. He just never told anybody uh, about what he gave away. And um, we've got a bit of a rule um, when we give money. We, we never take into consideration whether it's tax deductible or not. Um, we'd like it to be, but if it isn't, we, we, don't, we don't even consider that um, uh, in that decision. And um, I, I think that giving away is more about the person who gives than the person who receives. 
because once it's gone from you, it's not your responsibility anymore. I think people are inclined to be manipulative with the things they give so that um, when it's received by somebody, they have to comply with certain conditions. I don't believe in that. Um, I think uh, if I give something to God, which is how I regard it, um, then uh, it's up to him to sort it out. And, um, you know, uh, I think sometimes you're, you're, um, you don't give because your income's not coming in. That's okay. If it's based on a percentage, that's just fine. Um, but if you're getting, um, I believe that some of that has got to be give. Uh, it's just the way the world works, the way God works, and the way I work. Now, Frank, I think that you might have a slightly different take on, on the philosophy of philanthropy. Um, when did you first get involved in that and why? Well, <clears throat> um, I grew up in a very tight fellowship, Christian fellowship, uh, which subsequently became a cult. Uh, and they, they believed in giving, or they believed in you giving. Um, uh, but it was all internal, nothing ever went outside of it. Mm. And my brother had left that uh, organisation some years before and, and because it was so tight I hadn't been able to see him. But when we were about to leave I went and spoke to him. He was called out of his office in Melbourne and as a good salesman I'd learnt to read upside down. And what he'd been working on before I came in was what he'd given away in the last 12 months. And it was back, and bear in mind this is 1974, it was well over $100,000. That blew my mind. And it also released me, and I thought, what a wonderful thing to be able to do. The Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Now, another word for blessed is happy. You're happy when you do it. It makes you happy. And you can have a lot of fun doing it too. Now, I'm going to, at the risk of uh, uh, incurring uh, uh, Craig's displeasure, I'm going to tell you about something that we've been doing, which is public, uh, for some years now. Uh, about 11 years ago, we took our dealers, we take our dealers away every, every year, our Australian dealers, and we took them to Thailand. We were in a resort and there was a little village close by, and one of the dealers brought me this bottle of Scotch whisky, and it was called Braemar, and Braemar, of course, is one of our brand names, and she said to me, I thought you'd like that. I said, thanks very much, that's terrific. She said, well, it only cost me $7, so don't worry about it. <laughs> However, however, an, another dealer from Western Australia, and I mean they're all cowboys over there, um, he, bought, he and his brothers bought a bottle and they said, we're going to jerk Frank's chain at the gala dinner. So they got up on the stage and they started to auction this bottle of Braemar Scotch whisky. And uh, it got up to about four and a half thousand and I was just eating my meal. I wasn't interested in a bottle of Scotch whisky. I had one anyway. And the salesman, it all petered out and the sales manager came to me and he said, you were supposed to, to bid on that. Um, and now it's all fallen in a heap. I said, OK, we'll fix it. Give us the bottle of scotch. So I went up on the stage and I said, now these guys, and I jerked their chain then, they thought they were going to pull my leg, but I've already got a bottle of this. Now we're going to have a real auction. And we're going to auction this bottle of scotch whiskey. And what we're going to do is, whatever price we get for it, and it'll have to be a fair income price from one of you dealers, uh, our chari my charitable fund will double it and we'll give it to a children's charity here in Thailand. And I think we got about two and a half, three thousand dollars. So there's five or six thousand dollars went to the children's charity, which was great. The next year, he fronted up, knocked on the door uh, at, at the conference, and I opened it up and I said, "G'day, Vince. How are you?" He said, "Good." He said, "Here." I said, "What? What?" And he's got this bottle of scotch. He's put it in a, a wooden case with glass sides, and he said, "You better auction it again." I said, "Oh, okay." So we auctioned it again and the price went higher and the price has gone higher and higher and it's come back every year. And this year it was, we went over a million dollars for that bottle of scotch. <laughs> now, now, that's not all our doing, it's our dealers. And we got the dealers involved in, in giving to um, uh, children's charities, most of them Christians, and not all the dealers are Christians, but they're blessed in doing it, and it's a fun thing for them to do. And, um, uh, you know, we're, we're all in it together. So uh, that's, that's just one example. I will say this, 
that we've been tested at times when we've been in severe financial crisis and I've made uh, commitments to people that I'm going to, over a period of months, give them certain amounts of money. And I have always but once I've, I've done that. And uh, God, God honours you for that sort of thing. Yeah. Sorry. That, that's on, that's well. great. Well, we've come to the end of our questions and uh, pretty much have come to the end of our night other than to have Craig come and wrap up. But why don't we thank Frank and Bob.